Good day and welcome back to the 40 OG podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. How are you guys doing today? It is lovely to be back on the podcast doing another really, really interesting episode. Today, we're going to be talking to Brandon, who is somebody that um, got up, got in touch with me via Instagram. Um, basically, we, ha- we had like one of the pre-chat calls that I usually have before podcasts, like think of the topic and think of questions and stuff. And we got on so well that we were like chatting for like over an hour. So it was really nice. And Brandon's got a really awesome story, um, as well as recently deciding to kind of um, dive into the autistic community, create create his own kind of style of posts, which are, you know, gym and autism related, which is, is always really cool to have another person like that in the community. Um so yeah, we're basically going to be talking about a lot of a lot of different things today. Sort of the the school system, things around misdiagnosis, things around general life experiences that autistic people may have, as well as I guess some things to do with unemployment and employment and getting into the work, feeling okay with life in lots of different areas. So it's going to be a very kind of all-encompassing podcast today and uh yeah i'm very happy to introduce my guest mr brandon christ how are you doing i'm doing good it's a good introduction i appreciate it um (laughs) yeah i'm excited to be here um like you said we had a really cool conversation and we i mean we've been having a good conversation uh before we started recording here um but i'm excited to be here and you know i hope people who are here watching and listening, take the time to make it through and listen to us. Cause I feel like, you know, it's going to help some people today. And that's really what I'm here for. And I know that's what you're here for. And I would mm-hmm. assume that's what people who are listening are here for. So totally. Well, um, when we were chatting before, like it's, it seemed like you had a, a very keen interest in kind of sharing your story after kind of a lot of years of, not knowing that you're autistic and and sort of perhaps not feeling okay with talking about it. So that I'll have a kind of twofold answer for that one, right? So, and we'll most likely get into it either after my answer or at some point during the podcast. But, sure. um, you know, I was misdiagnosed as bipolar, like super young, you know, and so I, I've always had a lot of um, struggles and a lot of problems every day that have impacted my daily living, my work, my school, literally, you know, as you know, every aspect Mm -hmm. of my life. And so I've kind of always been open with people um, and with the public in terms of um, what makes me different, so to speak. So in the past, it was always like I have bipolar disorder, you know, and this is why X, Y, Z. And it wasn't until, you know, about, January this year when I received my diagnosis of um, level two autism and ADHD combined that I started to, you know, be open about, you know, having autism and being autistic because it was honestly a huge relief to me. Um, And I'm really trying to find the right words for it because I don't want to upset anybody, but like, I get, I was happy. I wasn't bipolar, you know, not necessarily because I am not talking good about others who have bipolar because I mean no harm and they're great people and they struggle a lot, you know, and all that stuff. But, you know, the way that my experience was with, um, the treatment and being told what bipolar was and the portrayals of it, um, it was not you know, something good. I was made to feel that, that it was broken and something was bad. So Mm. when I received the autism diagnosis and ADHD, I'm like, you know, I'm not bad. I'm not broken. Like there's real, real neurological. I was born this way. There's nothing that could possibly change the way that things are, you know, and it's, that's what it is. And I'm not broken. And so, you know, yeah. I don't know, I got it's, lost it's kind, there, of, but... it's kind of that interesting thing, isn't it? Because, like, I think, you know, with things such as autism, um, ADHD, there is very much, like, it's, it's not necessarily, like, very clear that it's good or bad. 
Um, whereas like things like with myself having, you know, depression and anxiety, you know, if someone could come along and just cure me of both of them, like I would like take it in an instant. Um, if someone handed me like a little pill and said, Hey Tom, do you want to stop being autistic? I'd be like, no, it sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I, uh, no, thank you for helping to, uh, put better words into what I was trying to explain. Cause, uh, that's, what's hard for me sometimes is honestly finding the right words. Cause, um, you know, my autism is awesome and I'm happy about it, but it, uh, really does, uh, cause struggles for me. Um, I get overwhelmed real quickly, like with what we're doing here, like out of nowhere, you know, so finding the right words is, is difficult sometimes if I'm genuinely being myself, you know, cause I was pretending for an extremely long time. Cause I didn't know that I had autism and I thought everything, everyone was this way. So I mm. just created personalities and pushed things like as far down as humanly possible to where I didn't feel, you know, necessarily anything. Yeah. I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to in different, different areas. Like I know that like for me, I wasn't, I didn't tend to mask when I was younger, but that was mostly because I just couldn't like, I just couldn't like wrap my head around doing the actual thing. You know, I talked to some other people who have masked during school and they were like able to like stay under radar for me. Like the only way that I could mask is just to be almost just completely mute. Like I would just, just like selectively reduce the amount of words that I use to such a degree that, you know, it'd be hard for anybody to tell really apart from perhaps like the nonverbal communication. Uh, people just kind of think that I was quiet. <laughs> it's so funny that, that you say that. Cause like that, so we're, we're opposite in that regard. My, um, the way I was, was to be hyperverbal, you know, and like create, like create conversations and create, um, like to get out ahead of anything that could have possibly taken attention yeah. to me or, mm -hmm. you know, like happened. So I tried to control everything and, you know, over talk and over explain and always be the one to be talking and all that stuff. Not because I even really knew what I was saying, but just because it was a lot easier than, you know, being a target and just sit, you know, standing there and sitting there with all the anxiety of not really knowing or understanding anything. Mm. I definitely went through kind of a, a similar sort of phase. It was yeah. probably like over the course of two or three years. I think it's definitely something that has like still had to some degree has its grips in me, like just in the back of my head, but like definitely like watching sort of content online, like on YouTube about like how you should be as like a man or a person if you want to, to be confident and like, I, you know, I'm much, you know, I'm very confident myself and I don't really feel much social anxiety around anybody, but I think some of the ways that I come across because of, you know, my, perhaps my body language or like my eye contact or, you know, any, any number of things, it does to some people kind of come across that I'm not very confident. Um, sometimes. And so I was like, all right, I need to like change things. I need to like put myself out in the best way possible. And I was like, Oh, I need to have open body language all the time. I need to like, um, not smile as much as I do, even though like, you know, it's, it's part of my personality. Um, all sorts of things which are like talked about a lot as that's what like confident men do, but you know, it's just so counterintuitive for for who I am, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes total sense, dude. Like I literally, so due to everything that I've been working through over the last eight months, um, mm -hmm. from, you know, reevaluation therapy, you know, medication, constant therapy. Like I've been going three days a week for eight months for an hour. Um, mm -hmm. you know, medication on Friday, it all just kind of clicked and 
for the first time in my whole life, I actually feel like myself, like I can actually get through it all because it was all just so much all the time. Hmm. And to be honest, I really, I didn't even know how bad it was until, um, everything just like clicked on Friday with the new medication regimen and, and, you know, all the therapy, it, it just was, it's insane. I got kind of scared too for a minute cause I could breathe, <laughs> you know, and everything's like, you know, and I'm like actually here and present. What do you mean about like the, the medication side of things? Did you, cause I know that you had a diagnosis of ADHD as well. Was that, is that what you mean in terms of the medication? Um, yes and no. So I had been on, um, I'd been using ADHD medication for, I'd say like maybe five or six months now. And it, uh, it helped a tremendous amount. Um, and it obviously, it still very much does. Um, it was increased, but the main thing, um, that happened is, um, I was taken off one, uh, medication and then put on to a different one that could, um, mm -hmm. replace it and help with my anxiety the next day. So it's a, a medication that I take at night to help with my insomnia because I just cannot sleep. And then it also works throughout the next day um, with anti-anxiety and like calming effects. So that combination of coming off one that was giving me negative side effects that I didn't realize mm -hmm. because, you know, autism and yeah. I also, you know, my, my therapist, the five haze. <laughs> yeah, my therapist is like, "What you know? You got to get better at this." I'm like, yeah, "I, <laughs> it just is what it is." Um, that's why I pay you. You know, you help me with that. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so I couldn't. So the the medicine was giving me bad side effects, and I, you know, because because of the autism, I had absolutely no interoception. Like you say, I couldn't you know, really place that it was something that was even causing anything. And then the other aspect of it too, is like, I felt like such shit my whole life and everything's been too much and so bad all the time that like, it almost, it didn't even matter that that was like an extra thing, you know, so, so just like the normal kind of baseline that you, because it's, it's weird, isn't it? Because like, for me, since I was, probably, probably early in 14, like maybe even 12, um, you know, I've been depressed and it's not some, it's something that sometimes gets better in terms of like the mindset and how I'm dealing with it, but I'm always depressed to some degree. And it's, I'm always to some degree, like anxious in my body, maybe not in my head, but you know, kind of, I kind of describe it as like having like ants on my bones. I only really experience the physical side of things. Um, I think that's something to do with alexithymia and, and things like that. But it's just kind of like my my sense of no normality is experiencing anxiety and depression to a mild degree. Like, that's good for me. Like, <laughs> when I was younger... You're like baseline. <laughs> yeah, base, you, ba when I was younger, my baseline would be like around like the moderate kind of level of both of them. And just like a lot of instances where I would dip into severe, but... Nowadays, it's very much more akin to the mild side of things. Uh, I only get like periods of time for about maybe a month or so, sort of during the year that it does get quite severe. But it's it's really weird when, like, do you think it's because you're have, older or you know how to cope better? I think it's is I know how to cope better and I know where to put my mental energy and thoughts. You know, like. Um, it's not even the case that I like think about positive things necessarily. It's more about, I guess, being okay with how I'm, how I'm feeling and, and what life is like to, to a certain degree and just adjusting things based on that. That makes so, sense. So more like reality therapy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Excuse so. me. Yeah. Is that um, my... the medication that you want? Just, just wondering because mm. it sounds very similar to, the one that I'm on, is it metazapine that you're on? No, um, clonopin. Clonopin? No, I don't know if that's like, I've never so heard of it. Benzodiazepine. 
Oh, nice. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, I was, I'm like, it's just funny because it's like, um, benzodiazepine stimulants help me function and feel normal. And, and it's like, like the opposite things. <laughs> yeah. And like, that's how I know for sure I'm autistic and that it's just how I was born because, you know, I've been on every antipsychotic and anti convulsant and SSRI and like, I've been on it all because they all thought I was bipolar, you know, forever. Mm. And so, you know, I'm just on like, in my mind was like kind of natural medications in a way. Um, cause they both naturally kind of occur and they just, I don't know they help, they, they work for me and I'm just grateful that they do. Cause, um, awesome. you know, I really could not keep living the way that I was prior to everything working out the way it is right now. Well, I'm, I'm thinking it would, it would be good to kind of get into some of the questions that we have here. I mean, I think the place that we wanted to start off with was kind of around like the school age kind of experience of, you know, going through, um, early middle kind of high school experiences. I think you mentioned when we talked last time that you had quite a difficult time in the school system. Could you tell us about like the behavioral and mental health issues that you faced during that time? Yeah. Um, so in general, um, my memories aren't necessarily the best, um, due to like a lot of stuff that I went through trauma. when I was younger and then <laughs> yeah, trauma. And then honestly, Same. like my, just my ADHD also, cause you know, that's kind of how it works with ADHD. Um, sure. I need like prompts to recall, you know, information mm -hmm. and feelings. Um, but yeah, trauma is definitely number one. And the fact that I've been in this just constant state of panic and overwhelm and overstimulation since the day I have memories, you know, I've always felt the way I've always felt crazy, you know, crazy, not, you know, to say that I'm crazy, um, until the other day. So I'll always do my best. It? It's like, it's like the idea of being weird. It's always in comparison to other people. Yeah, tend to, yeah. Not, tend to be neurotypicals <laughs> pretty much mm. and but yeah no school is a struggle and like i was telling you on the uh phone call the other day like every step of the way um up until you know now in adulthood um i just could manage less and less and less you know and yeah. i did fake it my whole life like i i really have no clue sometimes how i got to where i am today because you know, I've been white knuckling my way through life, not understanding, not knowing, um, mm -hmm. not fitting in and just, you know, moving forward because it's the only thing I knew to do. Um, you know, and that's how I got through, you know, high school and middle school and mm -hmm. elementary school, you know, here in the States. Um, I never really wanted to be in school. It was never something that was fun for me. Um, you know, in elementary school, I was obviously I had a lot of like attention problems. So I would be, you know, standing up, sitting down, you know, stimming in my chair constantly. Um, I was actually in special, they called it special education back in the day, mm -hmm. but I was in special education for a few months in elementary school. And then uh, somehow my family got me out of that because part of the problem is that my family just doesn't want to admit that, you know, I'm disabled and I don't use that word lightly, but mm -hmm. that, you know, I have legitimate disabilities and, and issues. They wanted to not admit that. So, you know, I can't be in special education yeah. and then they worked think, out think, this like, go ahead. I think to, to some degree it's like, I don't, I don't really have the experience of being a parent, but just from talking to my mom and also talking to um, other people in my life. Um, it seems like it some, sometimes for people, it, it, for parents, it can sort of feel like you're failing, like you've done something wrong. And so they, they really want to avoid it. You know, some, some people, they just ignore it. And then, you know, for example, with my mom, it, you know, she might have not really acknowledged it for a while, but I think once she kind of saw the reality of it, she did kind of switch a, a tune on it. You know, when I was told that I was autistic, you know, was, I was 10 years old. Um, and even, even then she was quite, I guess, 
she she just kind of put like a positive spin on it, which I think was really mm-hmm. helpful for me. And she's, you know, when you were talking about um, sort of white knuckling it through night life, you know, I, I definitely have, like, I, I relate to that so much because it's, you know, mental health, autism, what, what, whatever um, it is, has been very difficult. And I, I really don't understand how I'm still, still around at this point, but I think it's a lot to do with motivation and just like somehow just having some kind of like inner strength to, to want to carry on with things and move forward. It's, um, it's very strange to have like those two conflicting ideas in your mind. One is like give up and, you know, very heavily and you feel that to your bones. And then the other is just like this little voice in your head that you just kind of listen to, um, about sort of carrying on with things. Yeah, it's funny. So, um, I've always been extremely motivated to move and to move forward um, and to be better and uh, to do the right thing and to get to where I am today. So it's like, I'm happy that I'm finally at the point now where I don't have so much that I'm dragging behind me. Yeah. Cause, um, you know, that's kind of my, you know, superpower is just pushing forward and doing things that people say that I can't cause yeah. you know, that's <laughs> that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I was raised, you know, Brandon, you can't do this, Brandon, you'll never be good at that all through school. Like Brandon, you're a failure, Brandon, you're this Brandon, you're that you're never going to be anything. And so it's just like that, you know, if I can curse cool, if not, you can bleep it out, but it's just that you attitude that is just, it's in my bones from the day I was born. And that's what moves me forward. Um, Mm -hmm. still to this day, you know, and to help people, but, um, you know, without getting to the point I am with feeling how I'm feeling and having the um, ability to cope and actually feel good, you know, I could not keep moving forward anymore. Like I was just, you know, dragging so much that it did not matter how strong I got or how tough I was or how Stomach. bad I wanted it. It just, mm-hmm. yeah, I just, I could not do it anymore. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot of way that you carry as an autistic person sort of being so different it's we carry we carry with us a lot of negative experiences with life that definitely do affect our perception of other people but also of ourselves that we kind of hold on to in the back of our heads that can often be really damaging i guess you know it's it's one of the things that i tell a lot of people when they first get diagnosed is you know it's not necessarily like unmasking or um, learning how to stem or understanding your sensory things, but like actually kind of going through these, these, these thoughts that you have of yourself and trying to find where the root of it is. And quite often it's, it's the root of it. It's not necessarily to do with who you are or your personality, but as you do to miscommunication or the environment that you're in or, you know, and, and so it can, even if you do, you have done bad things sort of, to people or said said bad things to people it's you know looking at looking at it for it for a different lens for for what it is it, it really does help you process things even even if it is something that you you know i really clicked on with. something you said there on the saying or doing things doing saying or doing bad things to people hmm. like that really clicked in my head a lot cuz um, like I'm stimming like crazy at this whole time, but, uh, <laughs> you know, cause like to people out there and like with me too, you know, um, you know, growing up, I, I was, dif- I was a difficult kid, you know, I have, have, you know, what it level two autism, very bad ADHD. Um, and you know, I had a lot of outbursts and meltdowns and, you know, I was very mm-hmm. difficult and, you know, I would get violent. I don't anymore, you know, cause I'm older and I know a lot more, but, um, 
you know, I would get violent. I, I had no control over it, you know, and mm -hmm. I want to bring that up because I want people to not feel bad because yeah. it's, you, you can't help it at, at some point, at some point, you know, everyone who has autism, it's, you know, it is a disability for a reason because you become disabled sometimes where you're unable to act and behave the way that you want to. And mm -hmm. no matter how much inside you're like, no, no, no. And you know, what's actually happening and what you're doing does not match with what you're telling yourself, you know, not don't feel bad. Mm -hmm. You can't help it. And it's okay. And anyone that makes you feel bad about it, you know, isn't really that good of a person. It's kind of like, especially like in school, it's very much a, like a defensive thing because the environment's so complex and everyone's kind of like moving, everyone that's, that's your age is kind of moving forward socially. It's at, at a speed that you're not able to keep up with. And so you get into a lot of situations where you, you know, are taking advantage of, um, for, for those differences, you know, you can think of like direct communication and you know, picking up mm -hmm. on nonverbal cues. It's like, um, I think f for me, it was very much that my defense mechanism was to kind of go inside myself and not like react or not, not do anything like that. Like I remember a certain situation at school where there was like someone who, I don't know, for some reason they like punched me in the balls and, um, that's the best. I just, <laughs> and I just didn't react and I, I just like I, I, I like stone face them and usually that would have worked to some degree um, but it didn't because their friends came and they were like hey look Tom Tom can get punched in the balls and he can be okay and and so of course they all gathered around all me and did, started yeah. punching me in the boards oh the gosh um, so, so it wasn't necessarily the best in every if i was there case. man i'd have taken him down for you <laughs> that was part of what i did when i was in school too you know i like i would you know that was always my thing you know i'd always mm -hmm. get in the way of those things because it's not okay and um i've just always been able to kind of handle those things and i've wanted to you know not to mm -hmm. be the violent person but to you know stand up for you you know like people like you like and and me because that's you know, like you're me. I just, for some reason, have this, you know, fight in me since the day I was born. And, mm. you know, I've got to do something with it. So I would do, you know, good things. I would, you know, beat people up for you because that would not be okay. <laughs> not, if, not if I was there. Well, I, <laughs> and then we'd did, sit at the same I, lunch table. <laughs> I did get to a point where I was kind of feeling... Like confident, like I, 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 I very much felt like a ton of anger, even though I was so sort of, I don't know right word, placid, not uh, non-confrontational at school. Um, I very mm -hmm. much like held on to a lot of anger. So most of my nights that I spent at school, I would go to the gym on my own. I had like this, this scholarship because of doing my Taekwondo and I would like work out in the morning and, and the night and I would literally like rid myself of all this energy um i never actually got into any confrontations at school like that i like fully fully went into but i did have some situations where i'd talk to people who were like picking on my friends yeah it's, it's usually other people it's not me not me i'm like <laughs> i just yeah there, there was like these these two bullies that used to come like and steal our football and kick it over the roof and like twang our ears with like elastic bands and Bully one of them stuff. was like a yeah <laughs> one of them was like a really big guy and um he was absolutely ginormous um you know bear in mind that i was like at the age of 15 16 he was he, he looked like he was like built like a fully grown man who did strong man um mm. but i i went up to him one time and i was like can you stop doing that and he was like looking at me like like because no, nobody ever like said that to him before that you could and it was like, he's tried to do it again. I was like, no, please don't. It's not comfortable. Um, and I was talking to him and I was like, do you not have anything better to do than come and like harass us at lunchtime? Like, I'm not saying it in a aggressive way or like a, you know, you're just way, having but... a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, that was kind of like the first time that I'd really 
I guess, con- confronted someone verbally. It's and it's it's very much something that has come in handy, I guess, in in adulthood. Like if if someone's just in a very confrontational, aggressive mood, just for no for no reason really, they just don't like the look of me. I just have a chat with them, and it usually seems to blow over okay. <laughs> I think no, knowing good. how to do martial arts helps as well because you just don't like feel a sense of danger, I guess, around most people. Yeah, that's fair. That would make sense. I know. I know that you, um, when we were talking, like it wasn't it. You, you tended to get like told off quite a lot for autistic behaviors. I think something that you mentioned mm-hmm. was like, um, like you had a lot of kind of behavioral modification like to do with like oral motor issues which is something that um... yeah yeah no yeah thank yeah no i remember that so um when i was five that's when that's why they started taking me to the um to the doctor when i was five Mm. so this is how adhd my brain is you asked me what happened between like when i was five and got depressed until like i got out of it and so my brain doesn't count the time before that, which was <laughs> when they were going through the behavior modification. Cause that's sure. what caused me to reach to that depressive state and then shut down and, you know, mm-hmm. internalize all that and be overwhelmed. Cause, um, that's what they were doing. Like I, you know, I was existing as a person with autism and ADHD so, and they would, them. they yeah. And they would stop me from being the way that I am telling me that I'm bad, telling me that it's wrong and that it can't happen. So, um, you know, over time I started to bite my nails a lot, you know, and then, um, they were like, you can't bite your nails, you know, that's not acceptable. And so I went, you know, to therapy and, uh, stop biting my nails. And then I started to, um, bite the skin off of, or the hair off of my, uh, hands and my knuckles and fingers. And then, you know, back in therapy again, you know, you're bad, you're wrong. You can't do that. And then I started to actually bite my knuckles themselves until they Mm -hmm. were were raw and would bleed. And then, you know, that wasn't okay, obviously. And now I'm back in therapy. Then I start pulling my <laughs> hair out and, you know, no, that's not okay. And so then now I'm literally just internalizing everything, you so know, they're trying to the- like remove all of these coping mechanisms that you have that, that yeah, yeah. necessarily pro- probably might not be good, but they're not like adding in anything for you to use. Like exactly. And I mean, things got so bad that I started to bite my, not my nails, you know, cause like when I went to kindergarten, that was like too much for me. And so, mm. you know, all that anxiety over stimulation and, you know, due to the diagnosis is, you know, caused me to start to need, you know, an outlet. Cause right. Part of what's, uh, I wouldn't say wrong, but part of what we struggle with is, uh, regulation and staying regulated mm. and, mm. um, our bodies don't do it naturally. So we need a physical, um, outlet for it, whether it's like oral motor or, you know, like my fidget that I've been messing with this whole time, or, you know, taking a sip of a drink, just, we need something external to help us to regulate and bring things to a manageable homeostasis level. And so that's when I started to bite my nails. Cause it was, you know, all too much. And even mm-hmm. early on, they were still like training those behaviors out of me, you know, up until you know, I went to the doctor because I only went to the doctor when I started, you know, self-harming in their mind. Mm. When, when you were saying your story about that, I mean, it kind of brought up the chat that I had with another kind of autism advocate called OTNL. And they were talking about like their habit, their stim of like sucking, sucking their thumb. <laughs> um, and that was, you know, obvious that symptoms. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes that can be not so great in terms of dental development you know pushy front teeth out is probably not a good idea but like they just definitely didn't give them any ways to to do things differently they're not like okay they have the oral motor needs so let's get them some chew things or let's like oh they must be experiencing these sensory things so maybe let's try and reduce the sensory or the like the social stress that we put on them it's like it's just never considered it's like exactly humans do things for a reason quite often exactly and that's honestly like one of the things i struggle with you know i love my family to death and you know i talk to them i don't hold them accountable because that's not really how you ever move forward in life so the biggest thing that i struggle with is that they never once to themselves were like 
nothing's working. Let's try something else. Hmm. Like that kind of like what you said is like, you know, people don't just behave and act the way they do for no reason, you know, and they just assumed that I was just what this way for no reason, because I'm bipolar and, you know, a brat and defiant and, Mm. uh, I hallucinate and I have cognitive distortions and, you know, all of these things that they thought that I was that I'm not, you know? And so that is like the hardest part for me to have overcome and to, you know, not really be upset about. Cause it's like, you know, if you really love somebody, you know, people don't do things for no reason, like you said, and you've been trying one thing for 20 years and nothing got better. You never once asked to yourself, Hey, why don't we try something different? Why don't we go get him reevaluated? Why don't we, you know, ask him actually like what's going on instead of keep doing the same shit and telling him that he's, you know, all of these things and not really offering any help. Yeah. And if I I think as well on like the side of resentment as well, I think like quite often we think of harboring negative emotions to other people that it has some kind of spiritual ephemeral effect on that person to make them feel bad but like quite often harboring that anger or resentment towards people it's actually like just affecting you <laughs> it's oh yeah like, totally they, it's all inside <laughs> and and like the thing is too about autism like you know i i, I harbor resentment over the person who's parked in my spot today yeah like yeah. i have to constantly like practice forgiveness and acceptance because like it's silly right like to normal people it's silly but to me this person's parked in my spot i've been parking there for three years they moved in like a week ago and now they're parking in my spot and i like yeah. literally want to blow up their car i will not do like, it executive but, like, function about oh, where do i park is that gonna feel okay do i have to move it in differently like yeah well and it's my it's tomorrow. my spot too you know, yeah. like I, that's the one thing that I can control in this world is where I park at the end of the day, kind of in a way, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like my routine, yeah. it's my, you know, control. And I, you know, part of my autism is I deep down, like in my bones, it's just the way it is because of my sensory issues and everything together. Like mm -hmm. I, people are extremely dysregulating. I do not really like people like deep down. I personally do, but due to the way that my body experiences the world and people, it doesn't mm -hmm. like people. And so it's not I'm constantly places, having to do that. Huh? People don't interact with us with the communication style that's most comfortable for us. Like we've got a mold to them. And mm -hmm. so like even nice conversations with people is often um, a drain on our energy. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. Like the, one of the ways that I think it's easy for me to tell that I'm talking to someone who's ADHD or, or, autistic is that I don't kind of feel this weird, like sense that I'm out of place. Like I, you know, even, even if I don't know that they're autistic or not, and it doesn't seem like it just, it, the, the conversation just seems to carry on and it doesn't feel like, I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain. It just but, flows. Yeah. It just flows. And also like, I don't know about you, but like, I've not once been wondering when I should speak or feeling bad about, you know, if I'm talking at the right time or the wrong time, or, you know, if it's your turn to say something or not, <laughs> cause that's, you know, that's part of what's so hard for me with conversation is I just, it, it, yeah, yeah. it literally doesn't exist for me, you know? And so it's mm -hmm. like part, you know, part of what's so comfortable and why this is a good conversation, you know, on my end for sure. And maybe you are feeling the same way is just cause like, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Like I'm just, mm -hmm talking and you're just talking and if i interrupt you you know i got adhd that's cool and i have autism <laughs> so i don't even know when to speak to begin with <laughs> i know i know exactly what you mean it's 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 kind of hard sometimes when i have neurotypical individuals in or some, sometimes people who aren't autistic as well um like sometimes it definitely it definitely does feel like i need to um like put in more of an active effort to like get the conversation like so, so that I can express myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, what, one thing that I did want to bring up is like the, the fact that I think you said that like using the word retarded was like a, a common word, like when you were growing up, like, yeah, um, you know, that's part of what I attribute, like, um, 
I mean, I guess maybe that's part of like how I cope with and move forward and not harbor resentment over my dis- misdiagnosis is that, you know, I was born in 88 in the United States. So, you know, the people first movement for people with our type of disabilities didn't exist until the 2000s, mm. early 2000s. Mm. So, you know, between that time period, it's still kind of a really gray time period um, when it comes to psychology and um, all and medication and all of that stuff, because that's when things were starting to change, but everything really wasn't changed. And they didn't even have, you know, th- that's like 30 years of information now at this point, you know, plus mm. the Internet came out in 2000. So, you know, you imagine how much information started to come about, you know, just from 2000 on. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't really feel bad. <laughs> what life would be like, like not having the ability to access over a, like a community, like a whole of the world of autistic people. It's almost like we're, we have our own like separate country to other people. Like, I'm, I that's what I'm learning. Yeah, that's exactly that. what I'm learning. That's what yeah. I'm learning. And like, you know, I go back and forth in my head, you know, like if I was diagnosed the right way and when I was younger, if it went you know, like it does now for most people, which I'm so grateful that it goes the way it did for you. And, um, that's not to minimize your struggles in any way, because we all struggle the same and everyone's struggles is bad, but I kind of feel a little bit grateful in a way because, um, I truly do not believe I'd be as functional as I am. And I say that with like quotes, um, if I wasn't born during that time, cause you know, I was kicked out of the house, you know, there, I had no option. Jesus. It was survive or not. And so, you know, I was going to survive and I had no, I had no choice other than to survive. It was either that or I'm homeless. Like, you know, so. Yeah. I can't that's imagine. Kind of, can't imagine. Yeah. That. So it's hard for me, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I wish I had, you know, understanding and all that growing up in the early nineties and, that kind of stuff. But, you know, it was tough love back then. And, Mm. you know, I was just, I had to survive. That was my goal. That was the only thing I knew up until recently. Yeah. I mean, I, I I definitely say that like the majority, the majority of my issues has come from just school, other people, um, not fit, not fitting in, not knowing how to fit in. That's, being pretty much the story of my life and you know being depressed is is uh a lot we're to depressed because we're too smart experience <laughs> yeah you know yeah, well, we, I mean, we know this all makes no sense related well, I, mean, I think we all know. Related, but... <laughs> for sure but like i think you know i think people with autism know that the world doesn't make sense the way that it is yeah and that you know it's just it can be very depressing because when you can see the reality of everything, it's like everyone's doing everything the wrong way all the time. Nobody really cares. The world's on fire and everyone's just having a party. (laughs) And it's like, you know, I think that's why maybe we struggle so much because we see the reality of things, I feel. Yeah. I know. I I was talking to um, Dr. Megan Neff on the Different Minds podcast, which I would highly recommend anybody listening to go check that out. Um, but I was talking, talking about my experience because I, I had a va- very big fascination with understanding neurotypicals and why they did things. And I kind of, I kind of got to the conclusion that I think just ne- neurotypicals just don't necessarily care too much for certainty around things. Like they're very willing to um, accept things for what they think they are rather than like going through and like testing it and really getting like a concrete answer to things. It's like group conversations. People, people say things like read the room, um, all of that stuff, but it's, it's less about the actual content of the conversation and like people just kind of emotionally react to each other. and, And quite often people will agree with something if it feel feels right not necessarily if it is right. And so you get lots of situations where you can have a group meeting and you can kind of, you know, I don't really understand what's going on. And there's kind of a lot of <laughs> different different things. And like, it just seems like at the end of the meeting that everyone's on the same page and they all say that they're on the same page, but they're not. And you talk to individuals from that conversation, they, they, they don't know. 
um they just kind of have their own idea of what happened <laughs> like um it's, it's all just amazing, was, man. yeah well most people operate based in fear that. Mm. you know most people operate based in fear that's why nobody really knows how the meeting went because everyone's too afraid to actually say they don't know what's going on yeah and actually yeah. talk about it and yeah. admit that hey like this doesn't make sense let's talk you know i think yeah. i think that's you know probably a big contributor there's a song by incubus called drive mm -hmm. that um is pretty pertinent to kind of what you're saying um and what we're talking about i don't know if you've heard it but uh essentially that'll the song is you our, know that'll be good for our um end of end of the episode song yeah that would be <laughs> um get, and, and the song basically says you know like um are you going to drive yourself? Or are you going to let fear, society, expectations, you know, emotions, circumstances drive you? Hmm. You know, are you going to actually drive your life? Or are you just going to allow it to be driven? Hmm. And I feel like kind of what you're saying, what I'm saying is that, you know, most people just allow their lives to be driven for them. They don't yeah, actually do, well, know, do so the driving themselves because it's easier <laughs> to just go along with it than it is to hmm. be like, hey, you know, I don't like the direction things are going. Let me take the wheel here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's not, it, the, the funny thing is it's like, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I haven't heard anyone say this before, but I, I, I've been on YouTube a lot and there's a lot of things kind of going around. You had this whole, whole kind of like alpha male kind of space kind of idea concept that came up. And then sort of more recently, you've had this idea of like a Sigma male that's, that's come up. And like, I'm pretty convinced that oh, like Sigma males or like the way that people characterize it, I think it's just autistic people. Like just, just can, you confident. can you explain more what a Sigma male is for me? Cause I'm not too caught up. Yeah. On. It's, um, it's, I'm just curious. I need you to know. <laughs> well, uh, alpha, alpha male. Autism is tingling, of... man. It's information. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, the, the alpha male is kind of this idea of this larger than life person that goes and like dominates and controls everybody in a social setting and Sigma that I get. basically like someone who wants to have full control over their life but doesn't impose it on other people. So it's 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 ve I mean it's similar but, concepts, but the, the slight difference is power. Yeah. And it's is what I'm is kind of what I hear. Hmm. And you you're not wanting to enforce your way of being on other people, but you won't like let people have that on you. And I was just thinking like, oh, that sounds very PDA. Like <laughs> don't want oh, to enforce like, things on other so, people, but <laughs> I'm so PDA. It I um yeah, no, I totally am. I cope I have to cope with it all the time. You know, like hmm. Even work, like I have a great employer. I love my job. I choose my job, all that stuff, but it's a demand. And like, I'd rather just not, you know, mm -hmm. like, and as silly as that is, like, you know, and I can do all the CBT, like I love work. It provides me money, which lets me, you know, do X, Y, Z. And, you know, it makes me happy. I make other people happy. It gives me something good to do during the day. But, you know, just deep down in my autism bones and the way that it works, it's like, it's a demand. I'm forced to work because like I said, this world is designed really dumb. We should not be forced mm -hmm. to be tied to a building for eight hours a day just to be, have a roof over our heads and be able to provide food and eat and drink. Like, you yeah. know, all that is just so silly to me. Like it's basic human needs that we're talking about. And we have to literally forfeit eight hours of our lives every day, regardless of whether or not it's something you enjoy doing. You still have to do that in order to have money to pay for things that you need to live. And or that's if you just think it's useful. Like, yeah, or, yeah. It's just so silly to me, you know. I don't know. No, I I completely get that. So uh, PDA is um, for anybody kind of the the idea of PDA path pathological demand avoidance. It's not necessarily oh. a aggressive sort of defensive kind of mindset. It's very yeah. much based on expectations that people have on you and expectations that people put on you cause people with PDA a lot of anxiety. So they tend to <laughs> naturally just have an aversion to that, you know? Um, so a lot of the ways that you, you get through it with, um, kids who have PDA is that you suggest things or is that you have a conversation and you 
decide things together or like so usually it actually even suggesting goes, things to me is doesn't work like no. you have to be very yeah you no i'm saying it. like you see you know it. my pd is so bad like i'll feel like if i'm unregulated and like my girl is like hey you know i why don't you know have you thought about me be doing this i'll be like i don't want to hear a word you just said like you just you're trying to influence what i'm going through right now like my brain just immediately is like i don't care you see it's a complex pda <laughs> yeah like and I, ha I have to get to a certain point in like my regulation stages to be able to hear something like yeah, that yeah but yeah. what does work for me as silly as it is especially if it's you know my wife who i love and trust is if she just does whatever it is she's trying to ask me to do hmm. then like because i love her help. and she's the person yeah. for me my body is just like okay so you know the pda you can't ask or suggest me something but if you just do it, then it's okay. Hmm. It tends tends to be with a lot of like adults that I know with PDA. I don't I don't know many to be honest. I know a few, but um, like for for me, it's it's a lot easier when people ask me for help. If they're like, "Can you help me with this?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, I'd love to help you with that. That'd be great." Um, it has to be a question. It has to be like a genuine like like I can I can tell like yourself when people are trying to get around you pda but if someone's like can you help me with this it's like it's pretty cool um yeah i ha i struggle with that at work dude like all the time my boss is you know and he's i love my boss and i told him today like i'm so grateful and i'll talk amazing about him and and the place that i work on this podcast and i hope he listens because he's a large reason why i'm here today you know he pays for my health care for me he's accommodating i wear i literally wear sunglasses and earbuds and a hat all day at work nice. interacting with nice. clients and patients and he just he lets me be me and i do a great job you know and that's kind of the give and take with autism and adhd right it's like hmm. if you just kind of let us do our thing and be who we need to be and do what we need to do we'll be some of the best people you'll ever have in your life but you know we do have a certain set of requirements that we need to live by in a certain way of operating that needs to be respected um, totally. and even though I say all of that and I love my boss still to this day, he comes up to me and he asks me to do something and he asks me nice. And my insides are like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> That's a demand. <laughs> even though this is my job, even though I love you, my insides are like, I don't want to hear that shit. <laughs> and then I take a deep breath. I use a little bit of coping skills and I go ahead and I do what I need to do. Um, but then that's sometimes where, you know, my autism will uh, kind of get in the way because it kind of builds up over time, all of these demands, you know, and then like I'll yeah, melt down, not up. because it's I've had a bad yeah. day, but because it's just like I've had so many demands on me and I've mm -hmm. coped for so mm -hmm. long that it just my body has to get rid of it somehow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Deep, deep breathing is, is helpful um, in those situations. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I, I guess somewhat along the lines of that, would you be happy with moving to the next question? <laughs> <laughs> or just that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whatever you <laughs> I'm sorry. We're just having a good time. You. I feel. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, actually, no, I'm not okay with that. Stand. Whatever you say, Thomas, just ask me the question. If you just okay. asked it, it'd be fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I know you said that you, you, you were diagnosed kind of with, bipolar with when you were younger but i'd really like to understand like the the medication aspect of things the therapy aspect of things um as someone who is you know looking back at it as as someone who is you know diagnosed autistic it's it's good to it'd be cool to like understand i guess what that experience is like for you um like it's just, there's just so much to unbottle there. Um, so maybe, maybe about const the medication. constantly being gaslit, I guess, you know, constantly being gaslit would be maybe the best word, but, um, yeah, no, like it, it was just also crazy. Cause, um, I was like 12 when they put me on medication, which is still way too young, you know, by, mm -hmm. Uh, by psychology standards and law today actually says you can't put 
um, anyone under the age of 16 on any type of uh, antidepressant or um, antipsychotic medication or yeah. anti-seizure unless they actually have a seizure disorder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so at 12, I was put on, uh, I believe Depakote was the first um, medication I was put on. Um, and then uh, I didn't react well to that. Um, then I was put on a different, another one. I'm not a hundred percent tri sure. Trilip Trilipitol, I think. That's so the one I ended on. You ended yeah, on Yeah. So like, yeah, like, so there was like Depakote and that was horrible. And then there was another one in between Depakote and Trilipitol. And mm -hmm. that one was horrible too. And then, uh, Trilipitol, um, and this was all to like help regulate my mood, right? Because they think I have a mood disorder, not realizing that I so have a regulation disorder, not a mood disorder, right? Like I'm always in a good mood to be honest with you generally. Like I, I'm just a happy, okay. Like I, I want to be here. I like to be here type person. That's why it's been so hard to not find any relief because deep down I'm a loving, you know, I want to be here type of a guy. Um, so I never had a mood disorder. It was a regulation problem, right? You know, regulation is different than mood. I can regulate my mood, but I can't regulate emotions. And that's different. Um, so they were putting me on the mood stabilizers and they didn't work. And Trilipdol is an anticonvulsant and mood stabilizer. Um, they put me on that one. Highly sedative. It, yeah. And it, and it worked because it, you know, it slowed down my brain. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like the first two didn't work because they were, you know, true like mood stabilizers and antipsychotics. And then they used an anticonvulsant. Uh, which is mainly for people with seizures and triliptal, which mm -hmm. slows down your brain's, you know, neurons and all that stuff, the neural synaptic connections. And so, no. you know, that, that helped not because I had a regulated mood, but because it, you know, dulled down all of my sensory issues. Um, and it so. dulled down, you know, the speed at which my thoughts can form and, you know, how I can move and pretty much everything. Right. Um, and they started at a low dose and, you know, over the years, still having regulation behavior issues, right? Because nothing ever got mm -hmm. fixed because I wasn't bipolar. I had a regulation problem. I had autism and ADHD and really bad PDA. And, you know, my family would like make it worse. Um, and so, you know, I would be going to therapy this whole time on these medis medications. And, you know, the, the therapist would be like, yeah, so, you know, we're here today. And, uh, talked with your mom and dad for 15 minutes before therapy. They said, you know, at dinner, you got extremely um, irritable and uh, you threw the salt at the wall and, you know, you stormed off and you slammed your door and then you started screaming in your room. And mm -hmm. they're like, that's not acceptable behavior. You know, what's your explanation as to why? And, you know, I would be like, like, Sounds like a meltdown to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so this is what I would say. I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. So my dad, I'm eating. I, I would be like, I'm eating. I remember this, like, because I do remember certain things, but I'd be like, I'm just eating my dinner, you know, after school, after baseball, I'm just having dinner, having my food. And then my dad asks me to pass the salt and I'm just like here. And I just kind of give it to him. And he's like, what the fuck's with your attitude? Like, yeah. why are you just being like, so defined, just being like here and throwing it at me like that? Like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing. You asked for the salt. Here's the salt. What's, what's up with your tone, Brandon? Why are you being defined like that and being so mean to me and like throwing and throwing the salt? I'm, I'm not, you, I'm eating. You asked me for salt. Here's my salt. Like not realizing that I'm in my own world, right? Tone and body language aren't natural. So I'm in my own world eating dinner after school. My dad asked me for the salt. So I'm just like, yeah, here, here you go. You know, like that's a bottle effect as well. Just, like with school, like you kind yeah. of fake regulation, you kind of bottle up all the stresses from school. And then, you know, after school or after, after work, even like if you're trying you don't to regulate get that time to regulate it, you can all just, just blow up or like, you can even just feel safe in that environment to some degree or like comfortable. And then that, that just kind of allows you to let the pressure off a bit and then it all just kind of bubbles over. And that's exactly what hap why that would happen at dinner, right? Because exactly mm. like you said, like I'm in my own world, I'm self-regulating. Dad asked me for salt, I give it to him, but I'm autistic. So I my body language and tone aren't correct. And maybe the behavior of the way I gave it to him wasn't. Then he's now telling me I'm defiant and I'm, you know, a lot mm. of these things mm. that I'm not. I'm saying no. 
he's getting louder, which is now causing for like auditory overstimulation. Plus yep. emotions make me very dysregulated. I can feel that he's angry. It's freaking out my brain. He's telling me I'm bad for throwing the salt. I just got done with school. I'm trying to regulate. So you know what? I'm going to throw the fucking salt now because he's <laughs> telling me that I'm throwing the salt. I'm pissed off at this point. You know, it's been too much. And now I'm having a meltdown. I throw the salt at the wall. I take my dinner. I throw it at the wall and I go up, you know, into my room and lock the door. And then, you know, I tell this to my therapist what happens. And then they're like, you're wrong. You're hallucinating. That's not reality. Like you need to be nicer. You need to pay attention more. Like there's mm -hmm. words and words and volume can't make you feel and do things like that. You're having hallucinations and cognitive distortions. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting about like the way that you're talking about tone, because I think quite often a lot of autistic people, like we, because, because we have a lot of experiences where like, we don't understand, I guess, exactly what, where the tone is coming from, but we do notice that something's different. And, you know, one of the things that just from going up and for, going for experiences, like any change in tone that isn't just overly like if someone's just talking overly positive and then there is a change in tone like i just assume that something bad's really happened or like Dude, someone's my stomach upset with me yeah it's just like you just kind of get this empty feeling in the back of your head you start dissociating a little bit you're like what's going on and then you ask my them wife and gets like... frustrated with me sometimes <laughs> i'm always you asking ask them. yeah you ask them, yeah like, i do if they yeah. don't give you a reasonable explanation for it and they don't explain it or they're just saying like oh it's fine it makes it worse and you're like well <laughs> something's happening i don't know what it is you're not telling me so like please do <laughs> please do i'm that. really happy to hear you saying this yeah yeah well because it's just that's exactly what happens to me so and this is the first time i've ever really spoken with someone like this who um has autism as well so you know, you just explaining that to you, me and, you know, the people listening, hopefully it helps them as well. Um, but that's, you know, exactly what happens, you know, to me too. So it's cool to hear somebody else mm -hmm. for the first time, really kind of say that in a conversation. And, um, that happens with my wife at home at t all the time. Sometimes it causes problems, you know, and it's like not even really her fault, right? Cause we'll just be having a conversation and then, um, you know, her tone or her voice will change, you know, very slightly language or they stop yeah, smiling just something or like, <laughs> yeah, just something slight. And then literally I have that panic and I'm like, what's wrong? And she's like, nothing. And I'm like, but your tone changed, but nothing, nothing's wrong. And then I'm still, I'm doing what you're saying. I'm like, well, something's wrong. Cause that wasn't normal. That's not how it usually sounds mm -hmm. like, you know, cause I still like, I don't know what any of it means. And my brain understands like the rhythm and the pattern of it mm. all so if the rhythm or pattern is off even in just a slight amount whether it's the body language like you said or the tone or the cadence in which someone's speaking then it trips everything off and mm. there could be completely no reason other than maybe they needed to take another breath or they needed to you know think about a word before they spoke it and you know, they had a different thought about something and they were like oh well that doesn't right. sound good like just a random thought or like mm -hmm. You know, maybe they're thinking about work tomorrow or like, but because they don't ex always express it directly, it's like, it's, it's a lot. And yeah, it's, I mean, you're so sensitive to people having negative reactions to you. It's, it's almost like being at, you are like kind of being sensitive, but it's not like in like a needy way, I guess it's like, you well, just, I need to know what's going on. So I'm safe and I know how to behave. Yeah. Yeah, that's really exactly. what happened. What it is for me, like it's I need sad, to know how to act. I need to mm -hmm. know how to act. I need to know what to expect so I can react. Sure, sure. What What about uh, like sport, baseball, and and gym and things like that? Because I know that when we when we spoke, you were telling me about saved um, my life. <laughs> sort of the role that yeah that it played in played for you, um, and so I, I think you told me about sort of some of the issues that happened around college and university, um, which, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I guess like it would be good to, to know more about the sports side of things, but also a bit about uni life. Yeah, no, honestly, um, I'll briefly touch on sport. Um, not because it doesn't mean anything, but because the gym 
and training is mm -hmm. much bigger than baseball ever was for me. And I'll use baseball as a way to get into university. So, you know, sure. baseball is kind of what got me through, you know, school, honestly, you know, just that whole time period between, um, you know, being a child in early twenties, you know, um, and going to college, it was my thing. I've always loved to be physically active. I've always needed to, as you know, I'm sitting here the whole time moving. I just am always on the go. Um, and so baseball was, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, um, you know, baseball was huge for me. It gave me that outlet. It was an amazing sport. Um, you know, it had social rules, right? We were all talking about the same things. We were all doing the same things. Um, it was, you know, it made sense and I had friends because of it and all that stuff. And I was really, really good at it. And, um, going into high school, I was great. I was getting scouted by colleges. Um, you know, high school is too much. I hate it. Um, so all I did was really focus on baseball. I didn't really pay attention in class. I didn't care about mm -hmm. anything, not because I'm not smart, but you know, all my diagnoses and misdiagnosis at the same time, you know, I just didn't care. I wasn't really capable of caring. And I just focused it's on baseball. Isn't it? Like, and it's, it's really good for making friends because on one level, mm -hmm is something that you're interested in. So you're like, oh, these people are interested. Why well, interesting? I can talk about this. But also the endorphins that you get, like the release of anandamide in your system from like getting a high from exercise. Um, you know, it's it's good. It's like a social lubricant, like like alcohol, but it's like a natural kind of thing. It, so like, um, I'm like numb to that. So my, <laughs> like, it's so weird. Like my, the way that I, things present to me is like, uh, my reward system isn't really the best. Um, sure. like I'm usually just happy. I did a good job and I did something that I wanted to do because it takes out um, kind of, yeah. Cause my, my executive functioning is crap and both my diagnosis is made doing things uh, kind of difficult. Not that I'm not capable and I don't have fun, you know, internally, but, um, there's never like that big dopamine, you know, reward for me mm -hmm. because I'm putting in so much effort to get everything done that, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of where all of that goes is, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the act of doing the event, like there's nothing left over when it's over with, like, I just, I just did it all. Sure. Um, but it does something for me when I'm not doing it anymore. So like if yes. I wasn't physically active and I didn't train like I did, it would, I wouldn't be as okay as I am when I'm not yeah. training. Yeah. And yeah. so that's why I do what I do and I love to do it, not because of how I feel after, but because I, I know how I'm going to act and behave once I do do it. And that's been something that's really hard for me with my diagnosis is to like, just get things done in general, because mm -hmm. You know, how hard is it to rely on, you know, like three weeks in the future all the time? Mm -hmm. Cause that's, mm -hmm. you know, kind of what it takes with working out, right? It takes about three weeks, four weeks for you to really like see and feel, you know, the difference in your everyday life. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of how most things are in life. I don't really get that, you know, initial, oh, you know, I did a good photo shoot today and, you know, made a few hundred dollars and they love my pictures. Like, woo, -hoo. like that's not. <laughs> That is like, I did a good job. I got money and someone's happy. Cool. Like, you know, I, it, so it's weird for me with that, but yeah, now, now that you mention it, it's, it is very much like, I, I think I'm, maybe it's an alexithymic thing. It probably is. I mean, it, it pretty much leaks into every area of my life, but like, oh no, it does. Um, it should. I probably do <laughs> feel, I probably do feel like quite good, but I don't recognize that I do. And so I don't like, right, like internalize that it's, it's, it's very much a thing of like, right. I've ticked off my list. I feel comfortable that I've done the thing that I do and yeah, that's good. It's like your and routine thing. Yeah. Um, it's good and then for you. Someone's like, you train really well. I was like, cool. <laughs> Thanks. I'm like, great. Get away from me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Fuck out of here. I'm training. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Training and baseball, man, they, they were everything to me. And I'm a big proponent, like, um, 
of people in general training, but I really do believe that people with autism need to, I, mm. I think, mm. I think it's a need. I do not think it's, um, it's so regulating. It's like it, it needs crazy. to be done. And, and what you overcome when you're doing it is translatable to everything. Right. So like, instead mm. of going to therapy and doing exposure therapy to sound, let's go to the gym and train. Let's, mm. let's do exposure therapy, doing something positive you know, mm. with your time and with your body and with your mind around a group of people who are there to do something similar to you and mm. that are there to help you and, mm. um, people who, you know, are like you. And why don't we do it that way instead of, you know, like I said, sitting in the therapy room and listening to different sounds and mm. like, you know, kids aren't going to be as susceptible. It doesn't, even to work. Anyway. It doesn't work like, no, with all like not people. at all. We, we don't, it didn't work with me. We don't habituate and, like it being exposed to things over a long period of time. Usually people habituate to it and stop like kind of experiencing it to us to an extent or like the brain tunes out. But for us, it's not like that. Like it's exactly. And I mean, that's why I still, you know, I wear earbuds when I'm training. Um, I wear sunglasses. I'm wearing sunglasses now, even inside, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. when it's cloudy talking to you. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, it makes my eyes hurt and, then that makes my overstimulation, you know, levels get out of whack, but, you know, training it, it, you know, people need to do it and they need to, you know, it's like, there's a hard line, right. When it comes to autism and like sensory sensitivities and stuff like that, there's a, there's a hard line between like, let's make sure that you're safe and you feel good. And let's make sure that you don't allow this to dictate your future and mm -hmm. dictate, you know, how you act and how you live in this world. Cause you know, there are certain things that are disabling to me, but they're not because of my sensory problems or because of my PDA or anything. Cause I will not let anything get in my way of doing what I want to do, regardless mm -hmm. of what that thing is. Like sure. I'll light myself on fire to do what I want to do. And mm -hmm. You know, that's something that I hope that I can maybe bring to this community isn't necessarily, you know, that these struggles aren't real because they are and that it doesn't hurt and that it isn't overstimulating and that you're not maybe going to have a meltdown when it's over with when you're at home, but that it's worth it because either in my mind, you light yourself on fire or you sit at home and drown. Mm. There's no in between. So, you know, light yourself on fire and do something you want to do. Cause either way you're drowning it at home and, mm -hmm. you know, there's just gotta be a way to, you know, help people with that. I feel. Yeah. I think, I think there's definitely like, as you said, things that you can do to help yourself. And like, I think especially starting things that are new to you, you know, taking it slowly once, once you get into it, but you know, just the general experience of going to the gym, like, or even with fighting, to be honest, I've, I've never had an experience where, you know, I've had meltdowns, I've had panic attacks before fights. I really enjoy doing it, but it's just a lot of pressure um, on, on me. Yeah, it's more of the social me. pressure and the expectation that you put on yourself. Social pressure and expectation. Um, yeah. And so, you know, that that sometimes called that, but I, I never pulled out of a competition. Um, I've been kicked extremely hard. I never pulled out of that fight i never you know at the gym there's only been probably a couple of times that um i've stopped working out because of like the sensory or the social environment um but that's because you know i i couldn't speak and i couldn't move and you know i had to go oh, no, and that's what i mean like sometimes that's like you that's gonna happen but wouldn't you rather that happen than be drowning at the house you know oh, and totally. just like like not doing anything and and also what what happens when you're at home i should be doing something i should be mm -hmm. at the gym i should do this i should do that that's what i mean by drowning so like either you light yourself on fire and maybe that happens to you you know mm -hmm. and you handle it the way you need to you go home you know and that's going to be okay but mm -hmm. you're not drowning you at least tried yeah well i i guess sort of as on on a similar note to that i mean i think we were talking about yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not answering your questions directly. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> We're just, no, no, I'm no. just flowing with, you know, no, don't worry about it, man. Um, it's, uh, I suppose it's, it's different. Like 
in in a different way, I suppose, because you were talking about sort of staying at home and drowning. Um, I have a lot of experience with that. And, uh, you know, being in those states where you don't have a routine because you can't cope and you can't cope because you don't have a routine. Um, and so you and it's overwhelming to even more. create a routine because you're in yeah. such a bad space. Yeah, I get you. And you reach for those kind of blanket methods that are quite easy to like reduce your overall anxiety or negative feelings. Like, you know, for, for me, it was nicotine um, or, or alcohol was something that, you know, I picked up at university that I did that was, you know, for quite a while, which wasn't healthy. Like not in like mm. a party way, like a at home kind of, I need to try and relax that, that kind of way. Um, I know that you you mentioned that you had some experiences with um, alcohol and and potentially like some some liver issues due to like the medication interactions. Do you yeah, so no, thanks for thanks for circling me back to you know baseball in high school and college. Yeah, so uh, yeah, no college, right? So uh, graduated high school, uh, one point seven GPA. Baseball was life. Um, couldn't play mm -hmm. in college because of it, and so I go to a four year university. Um, somehow I got into a four-year university. I have absolutely no clue how most likely my mom was a large part of it because she was a counselor and in the school systems for a long time. Yeah, so, yeah. I think you mentioned that. Um, yeah, no, she's why I graduated. Um, they mm -hmm. weren't going to graduate me from this private school because of how poor I behaved and how bad my grades were. But um, she was able to get me to graduate, which is cool. And then she also got me into a four-year university. Um, but I stopped playing baseball, you know, so I like kind of had no reason to live in my mind. I'm at university for my first semester and it's all way too much, right? Like I'm by yeah. myself for yeah. the first time. Yeah. I'm not playing sports. I'm in the middle yeah. of strangers and, um, you know, fraternity is like, Hey, come be friends <laughs> with us and drink. And I'm like, all right, that's pretty simple. Like I just drink and hang out with frat bros and girls. Okay. <laughs> like that makes sense. And so that's essentially, you know, what I did the entire semester and it, you know, looking back at it, it wasn't to like cope. It wasn't in a, in an, or it wasn't to try to cope with how I was feeling. It was because I thought that's what would like, I wanted to fit it, you know, like I didn't like school was too much, like going to class, navigating campus, like all of that was overwhelming and too much, but I also, I really wanted friends and I was upset because I wasn't playing baseball and, you know, that's what everyone was doing and everybody liked me when I was drinking and, you know, after a while, I noticed it made the autism a little bit worse or a little bit easier to deal with. Right. But it wasn't like the initial thing. It was just trying to fit into a new world where I had no clue. I, I, I find that I think it's something that I kind of learned over, over a period of time, but, um, it's not necessarily that alcohol helped me socialize more. I think it maybe gave me a bit of relief from anxiety, but. Like, I think the thing that I like the most about like the party, like house party kind of atmosphere of things is because people were so much more relaxed and expressive. Like people, I could see what people were thinking and the way that people said stuff on their face so easily. That was too much. That's too much for me. It's too much for you. <laughs> yeah. I, like, no, I was so like, like, oh my God, like these people that I've been talking to in a sober state for a while and now they're drinking and like expressing all these emotions. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> I understand like where they, what, what they're trying to get across to me a bit more. It's, um, yeah, I still didn't, it was still too much for me. Like, and like drinking like parties for me, it was because they had rules and that's mm. how I, where friends were, you know, and yeah, that's yeah. how friends drank. And like, that's how, I don't know if I want to say bad, cause I don't want to say autism is bad, but you know, in, in terms of like my level with autism, like, it's at the point where I would, I was doing these things, not, you know, for any other reason other than because I was trying to fit in and do the right thing. And then things made sense to me, you know, like yes, we went yeah. to the party, everybody drank, everyone's going to behave and act this way. Like I might have sex with somebody that would be cool. <laughs> like, you know, you're right. And so it's like, yeah, I know yeah, what to expect. Yeah. I know how to act and people are pretty nice to me when I'm drunk. So like, you know, why don't I just keep doing this? And um, acting this way. Cause it's how everyone acts when they're drunk. And, you know, that's why I did what I did. It wasn't, you know, necessarily to, uh, to cope, but like I said, like the more I did it in, in college, the more I 
Agreed felt same. that it helped me cope with autism. And mm. so it turned from being just this thing to try to fit in. And, you know, it made sense to me to, you know, I want to be doing this all the time because, you know, maybe like I can interact with people when I'm not at parties and like, you mm. know, maybe I can be okay, like in public and stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's when my liver started to fail. Cause I was on, you know, triliptal, which is, um, go out, it goes through the liver. <laughs> yeah. And so it wasn't a good combination. And, I got really sick. Luckily I did. Um, I stopped drinking right away cause you know, I realized what was happening and I was really scared. I gained, um, about 50 pounds at that point. And, um, about two weeks after my recovery, you know, I, I was at home. I didn't go to a, a spring semester in college. I took it off. Um, mm-hmm. I worked as, at a restaurant as a, um, dishwasher, um, which was <laughs> you know, too much. Awful. <laughs> oh my God. It was terrible. My parents made me do it. They're like, you're not in school. You got to work. Like, yes, you know, that's yeah. how, what I mean. I had no choice other than to survive with the way that I was raised. So, sure. you know, here I am as a dish, you know? And so I took the semester off and two weeks after, um, having that scare, you know, is what I told you on the phone too, is like, that's when I made the choice that, um, I was going to, you know, take as much control over my life as possible. And, um, you know, I was going to get in good shape and I was going to eat better. And, you know, I was really in love with Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, you know, most people, uh, during that time and, um, you know, Lou Ferrigno and, um, Sylvester Stallone, cause I grew up on Rocky movies, you know, I was born in 88 Mm -hmm. and, you know, just like that macho man, like, you know, type of action hero. And, you know, I'm autistic too. So it's like, you know, these guys are healthy, they look good, they have good lives. Like they're not drinking, they're not, you know, doing drugs there, you know, they have wives, they have girls, they have success. So, you know, like I'm going to take care of myself and this is going to be, you know, it makes sense to me. Let me start training. Let me take care of my body. Let me take care of my mind, you know, and take control of this. Incredible. Like, exactly. exactly. I feel like autistic people are designed for sport because like, how else are you going to find someone who's just going to hyper-focus on something on a regular basis and like, you don't have to like encourage them to do it. Like they, they want to. <laughs> just... Yeah. And I mean, my PDA is so bad that I hate competition. Yeah. Cause I don't, I don't want to be forced to perform. I just, I want to do, I want to do it as good as I can and better than anyone else. Just cause I want to totally not cause totally. I have to beat you. Mm. You know what I mean? Like if you're like, I need thing, you to do true. this be- and show me how good you are. I'm like, no, no, thanks. Yeah. Won't do I, it. I was like that with, I, I mean, I wasn't so much like that in international competitions because I didn't know anybody and I didn't really care about what the person that I was fighting thought about me. But like in local competitions, like I, I've had, you know, some of like the head coaches kind of come up to me and talk to me at like training camps. And I say like, Thomas, you perform really well when you're actually in competitions, like against people like abroad and stuff. But like just generally like when you fight people in training or you fight people at local competitions you just like don't seem to be as like i just i basically just used it as an opportunity to get my anger and frustration out about life um mm-hmm. so you yeah, know that's why i struggle with baseball yeah yeah, so I was hit it as hard as you can. Just like, it's <laughs> like you know, yeah, it's like ugh. <laughs> depression ball. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I would get angry at the people I was pitching, you know, because I was a pitcher, so I get angry, you know, when I was pitching and try to throw the ball through, you know, so hard that I it just went all <laughs> over the place. But then, you know, the other part of it too is like, you know, I I liked to play baseball, like I said, because it's fun and I enjoy it. And I like to be good at it because I like to be good at it. Not because you want me to be good at it or not because Mm. the game needs to be won. Not because like I need to strike this guy out, but like, because I want to, like, I like it. I'm good at it. I'm going to strike him out because I want to strike him. out. Not because the coach tells me to, not because, you know, I need to, or else we're going to lose the game. Like I'm doing this because this is what I want to do. And then once it changed from that to, we've got to win this game, Brandon, get your head together. Like you've got oh, to yeah, pitch perfect. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you have to perform today. Oh my it's gosh. like, like, excuse me, I'm here to have fun and do my That's thing. Resonating like, with me so much. Hell no. like, I'm not going to do that at all. Now. <laughs> I, the, the way that people train me 
like they pretty much don't do anything with me because they don't need to because i will like my baseline level of training is go as hard as you can it's like as soon as i get in there we're just warming up having a jog i'm like sprinting around in a circle just to like you know mm -hmm. um but i i don't know whether that's because i want to or i just don't want people to tell me that i'm doing something wrong or i'm not hard trying hard enough for so it's almost like a preemptive way of avoiding those PDA situations. <laughs> like it's just like Thomas Could do be. this a bit differently, or you know, just kick a bit harder. And I'm just like, hmm, what do you mean? <laughs> no, I'm not going to. <laughs> it totally Tell me could what be to that. Do. It just let's For just me, ignore them, give them back chat. Like, <laughs> like when you go hard in your training. Like when I so like when I'm physically training, I go I go really really hard, mm. um, because I love to, but also because this is kind of the weird gift with autism for me. I can't tell when my muscles are tired. Yeah, me too. I can't. The, the blump, so the blump pain. I'm not very good with blump. Doesn't right. feel heavy after a certain yeah. point in time. Like yeah. once I'm going and I'm in the zone and I'm training, like there could be, you could put 800 pounds on my back and ask me to squat and it'll feel like 500 because I'm just, I'm in the zone. Like, and then once it's over with, then I'll be hurt. Then yes. like, oh, shit, yeah. did too much. But when I'm actually doing it, I, I don't get that tired sensation from my body mm. until I literally can't move. So, um, it's taken so a while you, for you me to learn how to pain. train, like, like yeah, no, I, pain, you just, well, and I like the pain actually stop. too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's twofold. Like I, I like the pain a lot as like, I don't know why, but I really like the pain of training. Um, I think maybe just because it helps me to be present and, you know, it's the Rep one type of pain that I can control, yeah. you know, like I control this pain that I put myself through. Whereas, you know, the pain of the world and my sensory issues and my executive functioning problems, like I cannot control that. So you know, why don't I put myself through the most painful shit at, as possible every single day on purpose? So that <laughs> way, like everything else is just kind of like, you know, a part of it, I guess. Um, and yeah, it makes, it, it makes me feel present. And so like, I like the pain and, you know, sometimes like I can just completely ignore it too. And yes. yeah. so I only it's stop like, when my muscles literally are like, like I'll go to get another rep and the bar just like will not move. And then yeah. I'm like, help, brother. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> <can> here, help. <laughs> um, I'm lucky that my body allows for it. Um, and it's taken me a long time to learn how to make it sustainable because mm -hmm. uh, I got a lot of, I accrued a lot of injuries over my career uh, with weight training because, because of the autism, like not yeah. knowing when to stop, not knowing what too much is and mm -hmm. just loving it and doing it too much. And then also, well, here's the flip side. I didn't know how to move my body because it's not instinctual to me. Hmm. So like in my mind, I'm mimicking like videos and pictures of people <laughs> doing the exercises <laughs> while I'm doing it, but that's not how your body moves. That's how it looks in the mirror or on TV. And so I'm doing it wrong, even though it looks right on video, but it's yeah. not because I'm not doing it right. And so I've, I got really hurt for a long time. And uh, that's another reason why I'm lucky to be working where I work at Tideline. Um, cause it's a physical therapy sports performance practice. And, um, <laughs> he noticed like right away, my body did not move the right way. And he's like, I'm going to give you free treatment until we fix this. And so he's treated me for free and taught me how to use my body the right way and, uh, improve my motor patterns and let me know, like teach me how to program the right amount of exercise so mm -hmm. I can still exhaust myself the way that I like to, but that it's not negatively impacting my health. Um, sure. yeah, sorry for, I just wanted to make sure I get all this out. Cause you no, know, no, part no. of, part of my ADHD is like, if I don't just let the train roll, like it's not going to roll anymore. <laughs> no, you mean. No, you mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so, um, it trainings, everything to me and it taught me my social skills too. You know, um, that's uh, another reason why training means so much. And I, you know, I encourage people with autism to train cause um, it was kind of the last thing for me, you know, I was fired from pretty much every job that I ever had because, but not pretty much, I was fired from every job I ever had, even, um, jobs at the gym because, you know, of the autism and not following social rules and like breaking the rules, even though they weren't rules, like I'd break company rules that weren't written rules 
And yeah. then like I'd get in trouble or they'd be like, Hey, you did this wrong. And my PDA would be like, no, I did, you know, and then I, would mm-hmm. you know, get in trouble. Um, and the gym was the one place, you know, that taught me these social skills that taught me how to better myself. It did make me feel better. What I learned in the gym with the discipline translated into life mm-hmm. with like the meals and, you know, just being disciplined in my routines. And, you know, I was kind of okay for a while being misdiagnosed as bipolar and, you know, in, you know, in the gym industry. And then it was the one place I could work where I could overcome all of my autism symptoms because I love the gym that much, right? It's my special interest. So like I can follow dumb rules because I love the gym and I want to like help people, you know, train in the gym. But even that wasn't enough after a while, you know, I got fired from uh, every gym job I had until uh, I worked at this place called Soldier Fit. Um, you know, Danny Farrar owns that company, Harry Santucci owned the location that he hired me at. But um, I would not be who I am today if it wasn't for this organization as well. Um, They took, he, you know, hired me as a general manager and the first like year um, was so hard for me because I had autism and Mm -hmm. I didn't know it. Right. And so he's having to teach me how to like talk to customers and how to talk to employees and how to sell memberships and how to behave myself and like all of this stuff. And luckily, because it was a military company, they had all of these videos on training for how to talk to customers, how to talk to, you know, um, your employees, how to sell memberships, how to do, yeah, literal blueprints to life. And then not only that, but they provided me books. They gave me books to read that helped me learn how to have uh, conversations and, um, you know, how the world works and how money works and how businesses work. And so, you know, I'm learning all of these amazing skills that they're working with me on, you know, for four years. And, you know, that's really what helped me to kind of be functional because before that, I had no clue about anything because nobody ever really took the time to teach me these things. And somehow I found that, you know, in a small business mm-hmm. in Northern Virginia. Um, and then again, I found it, you know, down here in Florida, uh, working for uh, Tideline. And mm-hmm. so I'm just very grateful, you know, for the gym. And that's, you know, why I encourage people to, to get into it because it's a great environment. Um, saved my life, taught me everything that I know. Definitely. I, I, I think... You know, sport sport of any kind, as I said, great for finding people, good inter- good similar interests to you. Um, What's also, your favorite body part to train? <laughs> actually, my well, my least favorite is arms. I really don't like training like isolation exercises with arms. I just find it. I don't know what it is. It's boring. It. They're so small. It's such yeah. a, like to me. It's such a small body. It's like almost a waste of time. They're like so small. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd rather train legs or my back, something um, that you can lift a lot with. Yeah, mostly compounds. To be honest, I'm. I really like uh, at the moment uh, the AD press, kind of very high incline press. Um, that's been been really fun for me. Um, I really like. I really like uh, doing wide grip pull ups um, at the moment. I maxed out the lat pull down machine like a few years back. I did like 15 reps on all like, the max one, all the pins, the whole stack. Um, <laughs> yeah. I actually couldn't do it anymore now because I was, I think I weighed about 140 kilos then. I was quite, quite hefty um, in, a, in a fat way as well. Um, <laughs> but, I'll um, forgive you. <laughs> so i could actually pull it down but it got to a point where i had to get my dad to like hang on the bar so that i could pull it down and get it like set up um so i was just like all right i need to find something else to do and wide grip pull-ups that absolutely devastating for like my back it's just crazy um oh they're hor- they're horrible <laughs> in a good way you know <laughs> yeah. horribly good i love the i love the ones that hurt the most you know I like, <laughs> <I'll>... <laughs> it's just um, Calves, quads. I'm just always on the yeah. I'm always putting myself in pain, man. Like I love barbell squats, <laughs> deadlifts. Like uh, I love deadlifts. Don't like squats. You know, heavy barbell rows. <laughs> yeah. So I I only like squats because my wife told me I had small calves four years ago. 
<laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like we were, you know, I'm, you know, I'm posing in front of her, like every dude does in front of their girl mm -hmm. or their guy mm -hmm. at some point, you know, whoever their significant other is. And I'm like, you know, what do you think? You know, you think I look good? Is, is there anything on me that you think I need to fix? And she's like, no, you're beautiful, honey. And I'm like, no, like criticize me, me. some like, really bring it on. Like, yeah. Come give on, me like something. Yeah. I'm making her on. Same. Exactly. And she's, yeah, yeah, she's yeah. like, well, your calves are kind of small. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not speaking to you for a week. Like, <laughs> go away. And then I started squatting. <laughs> but when, when, um, you, when you do that, like, I think it, yeah, even to a certain extent, like it's almost, I think sometimes when, when I ask for negative criticism and, and people don't give it, I don't believe them. But if they give me, me too. at least something to, to work on, I'm kind of like, okay, right. So that's what I need to work on. And I'm like, okay, okay, I can work on that. That sounds good to me. Like, I'm very happy doing that. Um, I think I was the same same way with my chest. Like, I'm really shoulder tricep dominant. Like, um, very much so. Um, but the chest exercises have always been quite quite difficult. Um, you know, I, I think, I, to be honest, I like most exercises that... I just those compound moves. Um, I, I am actually liking um, upright rows quite a lot because I can load them quite heavy with like a cable, um, mm -hmm. and they they hit my 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 lateral heads and my my shoulders, so that's good. And they also hit my traps, and they like. I think some people have shoulder issues with doing them, um, but I think it's a little bit demonized to some extent. They have shoulder issues because they're not doing them. <laughs> yeah. I don't do them properly, or like even yeah. um, uh, red out flies. Like Love I don't those. do red. I don't do them properly. Um, I literally like. Do you know like the old school um, chest expanders that you can get? Yeah, yeah. They were like the springs where you just like pull them apart like that. Well, I was really, I, I started doing them as like a as like singles at a time. So I started like just pulling them apart using like my entire upper back and my shoulders and stuff and then letting go. And I, I did that for ages. And I'm at this point, cause it's like a, a dual machine. So the, um, the, you can do the chest exercises and you can go up to like 130 kilos, 134 or something, um, on this machine. And, uh, that's mostly for the chest, but because I've been doing this movement for so long and just being like properly just pulling it apart for strength. Um, I, I can do like 134, like 15 reps, five sets, um, with the red out fly, just like properly going for it. So I, I'm very proud of that. Like it's, I, I find it quite, um, I have weird, Maybe, weird movements I gotta like fly that. you over here so we can train, fly you across <laughs> the pond. And get well, a session awesome. together. That would be awesome. No, I really would love to train with you. I love training, man. It's like I, I don't know. I just love it too much. And like that's honestly, it's something I felt horrible about, you know, up until uh, recently with therapy, you know, because um, I talked to you about this on the phone a little bit. You know, part uh, part of why I, I started training and part of why you said you got into Taekwondo was like, you know, to kind of fend off uh, bullies and to fend off, you know, anyone who would want to bother. Me. So pass, pass like, you know, as well, like, yeah, like, let's get as big work. as I can and people leave me alone. Yes. And also I just loved it so much at the end of the day. And so, you know, I'm feeling like about myself cause I'm like, you know, why do I love training so much? Like it doesn't make any sense to me. Like I, I love this one Ritualistic thing. self-torture. If I could, <laughs> yeah. Like if I could, if I couldn't do this, I'd be devastated. And the joy I get out of training is unlike anything I really experience, you know, doing anything else in the world and you know what the hell is wrong with me and you know through therapy and the right diagnosis you know it all kind of makes sense to me and, and you know that's i accept that part of me now you know that's just that's what makes me want to be i could not exist if it weren't for you know physical training and mm. i make this joke all the time that like i really do believe i was born in the wrong time period like you know, my autism and ADHD would be great as a gladiator or like, a, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, back as, as a warrior in Sparta or something like that. Like, yeah, yeah. I genuinely believe I'm just, I'm not in the right time. Like mm. that most likely is my issue. Um, 
because I've just always had, you know, I've always had that and I've always wanted to be a protector, you know, and to help people, um, which is why I like to hop on the podcast. Can I ask you a question now that I think I've been wanting to think? Yeah. Um, Come on. What's, uh, I guess, just like for you, what's your biggest struggle with autism? Like, what is like maybe the one symptom or like just the one area of life or the one part about yourself that like gives you the most, I wouldn't say dis disabled disability, mm -hmm. but just like the most like struggle day to day or like the biggest thing for you. Number one, I would say other people that's like. Like if, if the people around me uh, understand me and who I am and my needs, it's never an issue. Um, it's, it's kind of hard for me to separate out autism from mental health because I think most of the issues that I have when my mental health is good, um, don't have any issue. It's fine. I'm good. Like, um, I think for the longest time it was alexithymia, um, just because it's it's difficult to understand yourself in life and process things when you don't know how you're feeling about things. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd say nowadays, it's probably a lot to do with the executive function stuff. Sensory issues, I've had a lot of experience traveling, not having my headphones, um, a lot of experience at school, a lot of experience at taekwondo competitions. It's not pleasant, but it doesn't cause me any, like, it doesn't disable me. Like in a way that I would get so overloaded that I would have like a meltdown. Sometimes does, um, but very very rarely. So I, I'd probably say you know the the executive function is a is a massive thing because it does, you know, even to a certain state, it does impact like every every area of my life, whether it's work, whether it's just general self care, whether it's what's an um, example. Uh, not, not, is it okay that I'm asking you? No, no, I'm sure. I'm on open book. Yeah. So it's, it's good. Yeah. For me. Well, uh, I didn't know how your deep. brain worked. Like if it was able to, like, if you were expecting me to ask you a question, you know, I was trying to be considerate of, you know, your autism and stuff. Oh, it's cool, man. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, I think, uh, brushing my teeth, that's always been a hard thing. Um, grooming was a hard thing and hygiene. It's not so much anymore. I've kind of got into a routine of doing that. Although I don't tend to when I haven't been to the gym. What about it is hard? <laughs> the sensory experience of brushing my teeth, the time commitment, the um, the noise, you know. Once I'm actually brushing my teeth, I brush it for so bloody long. Like, I'll brush my teeth for like f anywhere from three to five minutes because I'm just like, you know, I want to get everything clean and, and good and I can just finish this. So if I'm in here, I might as well be. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, I'm, I've kind of managed to get over that, but everything is tied to the gym. Um, I get home from the gym. It's time to shower. That's an indication. I don't want to be sweaty in bed. That's uncomfortable for me. So I do that. And I'm like, oh, I could just brush my teeth in the shower if I want to. I'll do that. That sounds good. Um, you know, I get I get back out of the shower. I go to my room. I'm like, okay, I'm feeling quite clean. I'll just put my face creams on take my meds, you know, so everything's like kind of stacked for me. And if it's not stacked in that way, and it's already part of a set routine, it's so much more difficult. Um, it makes sense. Well, it's interesting because um, well. cooking's hard. Cooking is difficult for me. It's interesting because like the hygiene part is really easy for me, not because yeah. I don't struggle with sensory problems, but because not being clean is so dysregulating that I would rather deal with all of the problems with getting clean. Um, hmm. so like I, I shave every part of my body except for my beard. And that's number one, because, um, I, the amount of executive functioning it takes to shave my face is it's a real big, gotta get it. Perfect. Brain suck. Like, this is the, I, yeah. <laughs> like I cut, well, I cut myself constantly. So like, you know, I shave my whole body. Um, but I, you know, I, I always cut myself cause my executive functioning isn't, you know, the best. And after I do something for a long enough period of time, my, um, bandwidth for overstimulation, um, gets met. And so like, I kind of short circuit and I get like overwhelmed out of nowhere. So, 
that's not really cool, you know, on your face to have like cuts all over your face all the time, you know? And when I was a kid, this is a large reason why they thought I would self harm myself because, you know, I'd be shaving like my legs and my arms and I'd have all these like cuts on myself, not because I was self harming, but because I have sensory issues from all the, the hair on me and mm. all of that. And I'm cutting myself because of my disabilities, not because I want to be cutting myself. So Sure. that's a large reason why I have a beard. And honestly, the other reason too, is like, I don't have to pretend to make facial expressions anymore. You know, <laughs> the beard kind of covers up most of them, you know? So <laughs> it, it gives me kind of like a, it's like my mask almost in a way, you know, yeah. where, where I don't um, have to like be forced to be looking a certain way anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a benefit. I think definitely like, People just don't expect you to have as many facial expressions or when you do do them, it's like just kind of masked a little bit. So yeah, I, I, I see that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I like I, I've, I've had lots of issues with like, I can't shave my body. I have to like trim my hairs. The only reason why I do it is just because um, number one, it just helps with hygiene. If I like miss a shower, number two, it, you know, if you're, trying to do videos and take pictures of yourself to put on online. You want to make sure that, um, it's at a length that the muscles can show properly <laughs> rather than yeah, just being that's a part of it too. Yeah. Um, Definitely. It, it is just, it is the executive function. It's the transitions. Um, it's all of that. And, um, what, but once I'm in the role with things and my mental health isn't holding me back, it tends to be a bit easier, but, um, you know, I didn't even know how bad my executive functioning was until this new medication. Mm. Like, to be honest with you, because I've, I was always in a state of constant panic, overwhelm and dysregulation that like, you know, part of why I would rush to get things done wasn't necessarily because I had ADHD, but it was because it was so dysregulating and difficult for me to use my executive functioning to figure out how to open the box than it was to just rip the whole thing wide open as fast as it could, you know? So like, and like now that my medication's working, like I can actually like look at a box and be like, I'm getting dysregulated by looking at this box. Why am I getting dysregulated? Oh, cause I don't know how to can open this thing. And it takes like, <laughs> you know, a prayer from God for me to be able to figure out how to get this tape off without just literally going straight up commando and ripping the box. in half. <laughs> Which is like probably part of the reason why I weight train and I'm so strong is just so I can open things easier. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, you know, so it's like now I'm learning that, you know, a lot of that uh, rush to get things done and a lot of the, you know, mistakes I would make and the tripping and the cutting myself, you know, wasn't um, because I'm rushing and I'm not paying attention. It's because my executive functioning is so bad that. Like I'm having a panic attack while I'm doing things because mm. of the executive functioning problems. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I mean, when I'm kind of in a, a like it's it's, I, I think it, it very much depends on my mental state. Like, I wouldn't say that at this point in my life, like that I would consider myself disabled in any way, but things like cooking. That's just something that, you know, like, like yes. you were saying about too much executive function, like it literally, like if I'm cooking, I have to prepare the day before, like mentally not do anything. And then on the day, it's just this, this event, just this whole thing. And it, it's not even that much, like it could be just using one pan, but then, oh, I've got to wait for this. And if, does, is this heated? And, and does this look cooked? Is it, I just check every single piece of chicken, make sure that it's not like this. If I'm giving it to somebody, uh, I have to do all of these things. And then like, I watch other people do it and they're just like chucking things in. They're just like eyeballing it. And I'm just like, I don't understand how you can do this <laughs> without freaking out because you don't have complete control over. <laughs> it's just like, no, that's, that's, oh I totally, I totally understand what you're saying. And like, luckily my wife helps cook things for me, but, um, yeah, it's I very hard for me and it's dysregulating for me, but it's, um, it's cause the whole experience induces extreme anxiety because of the 
paying attention for so long and yes. and like looking yeah. at it itself, just looking at things to me causes like causes me to get overwhelmed and to get anxious. That's another reason why I wear sunglasses is, you know, I do have um, extreme sensitivity to light, but also my brain gets very overwhelmed by visual stimuli very easily. So the Lost longer I look at any one thing right. or the more of anything there is for me to see, the more overwhelmed I am. So sunglasses kind of help to, you know, damper that a little bit to where my brain can somewhat filter out a bunch of stimuli. But then when you transition to something like cooking, <laughs> there's like 30 pieces of chicken on this thing. Just looking at that without even thinking about how to cook it is causing me to have melted it right now. You I know, haven't it's about like, it like that at all, but it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, no, it's wild, <laughs> wild ride in our heads, I guess. No, I appreciate that. I mean, it's a good, it's a good way of thinking. I didn't think about like the, the different visual stimulation of like the cutting boards and like all the knives and the cutlery everywhere and the, the food and the sauces and like, there's, there's a lot of different, and I, I can't even remember. I can't even remember where to go either. Yeah. You know, like that, like I'll be cooking. Right. And then like, I'll be with the spatula and now I'm done with the spatula and it's like, Oh fuck. Where like, um, Do I wh put it where does the spatula yeah. go? And then yeah. I get overstimulated by trying to figure out where the spatula goes. So typically I'll just throw it on the counter and now, you know, there's a mess all over the counter, you know, and that's how cooking gets done for me. It's just like, it's just all over the place, yeah. nowhere where it should be. Like there's a disaster going on because I'm just trying not to burn the house down. <laughs> yeah. um, but I can cook eggs; they're easy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm aware that we've been talking for quite a while, and I know we had some some other questions, but I think we briefly touched on kind of the work experience, and I think you know, obviously, the gym was something that you talked about being really, really important, and your sensory support. So I feel like we've covered quite a lot and pretty much everything that um i think you know we wanted to cover so um how do you feel like wrapping up about wrapping yeah up? no yeah I, i'm good man i hope i um kept conversation well enough you know my brain just kind of goes the directions that it goes um and oh you, you're saying about you know wor worrying about the well not worrying but like the um uh not not being able to recall things but you know we've been talking for two hours about past things you know so i need prompts and like the thing is man is like i'll not remember this whole conversation like i'll finish with this i'll go sit with my wife now i'm not going to remember anything that we just did <laughs> until tomorrow and then i'm going to replay this entire thing in my head like all day tomorrow but i won't remember it once we're done and I really just want to say, like, honestly, thank you for, you know, chatting with me, man. Like, it was great to hop on the podcast and, you know, hopefully help people. But selfishly, I just genuinely enjoy talking with you. Oh, um, thanks, and I, I hope, you know, we keep in touch and that, you know, uh, we continue to talk whether or not we're on a podcast or not, because um, this was very beneficial for me just in general. And uh, you're a pretty cool dude. And I enjoyed getting thanks, to know dude. you better. Thanks, man. Likewise, you're 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 great to talk to, and you've got a lot of good messages that I'm sure a lot of people will um, take a lot from, and also also from from the experiences of kind of going through life, not really knowing that you're autistic and different, and some of like the different things that you've had to face. It's very very inspiring, and um, I'm very I'm very honored to have you on, and we'll, we'll have to get you on at some point because I'm sure that. This uh, episode is going to be very popular. <laughs> yeah, I mean, feel free to ask questions, guys. Anything that you want to know about me, or anything you want me and Thomas to uh, talk about, because um, I feel as though we kind of have two really cool, different perspectives, and mm -hmm. um, that's part of why this conversation was so cool. Because we're very similar but very different at the same time, and um, I feel like that's part of what um, made this conversation happen well. And I'm an open book guys. Like, you know, I was telling Thomas earlier, and I don't know if I've said this on the podcast yet, but, um, Superman is a huge idol of mine. It's, he has been from the time I was born. Like I never really had anyone to look up to. I didn't understand social rules, right? I have autism, but you know, Superman's an yeah. alien 
on earth and he has sensory mm-hmm. issues. He hears everything when he, you know, his eyes <laughs> hurt, he shoots out laser beams. Like he always has to watch the way that he's walking and breathing. Cause he might break the building with how strong he is. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, it's someone that I emulated and all he ever wanted to do was to use his differences to give people hope. And so mm-hmm. that's, you know, what I hope to do for everybody. So, um, you know, if anyone has questions for me or Thomas, like, let them roll, man. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And I suppose on that note, like, do you have anywhere that people would like la- you'd like people to go to uh, if they want to ask you questions or any like links or anything that you'd like to share with us? Yeah. So um, my Instagram is autistically be, um, which is uh, you know kind of a play on words, which is why I did it because uh, in a way it's um, unapologetically me. And then authentically me kind of wrapped into, Mm. you know, one word and then tying in the autism. And the reason I wanted to have that handle is because I just want to encourage people to be themselves, you know, and I'm not afraid to put out there that I am the way that I am and that I have the struggles that I have and that I feel and think the way that I feel and think. Um, So that's why my handle is that way. And I would encourage people to, you know, kind of get behind the movement a little bit and just be yourself. Like, don't worry about what anyone says or thinks, like believe in yourself because that is the only reason that I'm here and coherent today is because from the day I was born until very recently, I knew that I was right and that there was something going on and that I was going to make it and I was going to figure it out. And the only way that you can have that happen is if you're true to yourself and you're just unapologetically or you know autistically be brilliant brilliant and i will uh, i will put that link to your profile down below and if you are at all inspired by uh myself or brandon uh, about the gym stuff or fitness i would love to see some more like autism related i do i could do a fitness episode with you too if you if you wanted like a like an educational one like you know what are some you know easy things that people Mm. can do to start to you know get into the gym over time because that's what i do with my clients i don't actually work with pro athletes i don't like it i like teaching people like the little things and the habits Mm. in order Mm. to you know build themselves up so um, i I would definitely definitely be down for the the nutrition aspect of things i think that's that's yeah. the one thing that i don't do very well actually it's it's, it's hard um, as hell for me dude because of the autism but mm. i figured out a kind of a system and you know i'd be very happy to you know share that with people awesome well um hold that thought we will definitely yeah, get you, you on to do another fitness uh podcast soon and uh guys if you have enjoyed this episode make sure to give it a rate and if you are on youtube hit a subscribe if you're on spotify give it a follow so that you get updates on when new episodes come out if you want to check up on how i'm doing what i'm what i'm doing with my my day uh, perhaps check out some of my daily blogs that i do uh, please head over to at thomas Henley uk on instagram uh, i do do a lot of stuff over there um, i do post some stuff on youtube and you know i try to but it's it's a little bit of a different platform so if you want like the full kind of breakdowns and blogs that I do, Instagram is the place to go. And um, if you if you are listening to this and you have an organization or a business and you want me to get in, want want to have me in to do some training, uh, do some speaking on a certain things, maybe you're having an event and you need a speaker, uh, you can always contact me through my email, hi at thomashenley.co.uk. Well, that was very coherently said. Usually I have to do that a couple of takes. But, you're pretty um, tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um I, um, last thing um, before mm-hmm. we finish up, uh, song of the day. You gave me a song of the day earlier, which was something. Drive. Yeah. So, I mean, there's really, can I give you two songs? Go on. <laughs> Go on. Then. I can't pick. So I would say Drive by Incubus would be a good song for anyone with autism to listen to. So, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully they take it and they you know, drive themselves instead of letting anything else drive them. And then the own it song, um, by Adelitis way, um, is kind of like my personal anthem. Adelitis. Ah, there we go. There it is. It's your personal anthem. 
Is that kind yeah, of like I you know, play background? that song like, every day in the gym? Nice. nice. Yeah, I listen to it at least I well a lot during the day. It's it's the first song I put on in the gym because even though I love it, you know, due to the autism and PDA, I hate going to the gym initially. And I have to get through the first like five to 10 minutes. Yes. And the only way I can do that is by listening to these, this type of music that, you know, kind of helps me to get into that space and that rhythm of, you know, where I want to be. I'm just, I'm just having a little bit of listen. It sounds, sounds quite cool. I might, might add it to my yeah, no, I, list. <laughs> I hope you do. I hope you do. That's I, I, I love music, man. Like it's on my ears all day. Yeah. 24 seven. It's, how I regulate the words help me regulate the sound helps me regulate. Like I got a, I have a song for every emotion. I have a meltdown song. If you want me to share it with you, it's, it's loud. Do you like loud music or? Um, I do like loud music. Kind of like metal a little bit or no. Yeah. I love metal. Yeah. It's great. Okay. So look up self destruction by I prevail. I uh, know I prevail. That is my, when I am hating everything and I want to implode, that is my brain. And that's the song. And I, I hope you like it. It helps you. Uh, I can, I can say that I do have some very overstimulating songs. <laughs> like I've got like a, a play, like a playlist for different emotions that I'm in. And I have like an anger playlist and some of the ones that I have on there, they're just like, <laughs> They're a bit insane. Um, I don't understand how I can listen to them, um, but I really, really enjoy them. My I wife, like, my wife gets that way too. She's like, yeah. "How could you listen to this and you don't want to watch an Instagram video I sent you?" Because like, I don't know what the Instagram video is going to sound like, but I know this song. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but share totally. songs with me. I, you know, I'd love if you want to shoot me in on IG. Um, you know, any music that you like to share. It's a large way how I'm able to communicate my thoughts and feelings and to let people I know I care about them. It's one of the ways that I, I do that as well. It's, um, yeah, we've got a lot of similarities, but um, without, I suppose without without trying to trail on too much, um, let's let's try and gonna try and wrap things up. I think. I know, um, I know. I'm sorry. I'll go. <laughs> no, it's it's all good. I'll stop it's, speaking. <laughs> no, I'm I'm having to stop myself as well because I'm in the I'm in the zone um, in terms of speaking. Um, no, I've I've got yeah. I mean, you, I, my playlists are, are available like publicly. Um, if you if anyone oh, they're on your, your to your links. My kind of music. Um, it's it's a, not very. Um, tasteful for most people because it's dark trap music and very aggressive music but i do have a lot of i have a playlist which is a compilation of um calming songs but also the calming songs that don't have any um unfavorable like sensory input so um I'll have, yeah so it's called autistic chills that i have um and uh, I'll, I'll try and share that below if i remember but um if not Go check out the 40 or D song of the day playlist to hear the new songs that I've added. Um, definitely go check that out. And it's also on my, my normal kind of personal profile. So you can check out my other playlist, but um, yeah, anyway, um, been absolutely great to talk to you, Brandon, and it's been great to have you all um, for this episode. If you managed to get through it <laughs> and I will see you <laughs> have a good night, everybody. next week on another episode of the 4040 podcast. See you later, guys.